Hi, everybody. Thank you for joining us this afternoon or this evening or in the middle of the night, wherever you are. I am Rupika Rizm or Rupsi. I am the director of the Digital Ethic Futures Consortium, um, a wonderful initiative that's funded by the Andrew W. Mellon Foundation um, that aims to build capacity at the intersections of digital humanities and ethnic studies. Um, I work on this project with a number of wonderful colleagues um, who are also principal investigators, Kasia Valens at Salem State University, Tanisha Taylor at Texas Southern University, Sonia Donaldson um, at Colby College, formerly at New Jersey City University, and Jamila Moore Pugh at um, University of Maryland College Park, formerly at Cal State Wilson. And I'm delighted that you've joined us for our workshop with Brandon Walsh. Just before I turn it over to Brandon, I want uh, to tell you uh, about our next speaker series event. That is a workshop with Kathy Inman Barons of Portland State University that's on um, teaching with electronic literature. And it's on March 13th at 1 p.m. Eastern. And um, 10 a.m. Pacific, and we hope that you will join us. So without further ado, let me introduce um, Brandon Walsh, who we are delighted and honored to have with us here for a workshop. Brandon is the head of student programs in the Scholars Lab at the University of Virginia Library. Prior to that, he was a visiting assistant professor of English and Mellon Digital Humanities Fellow in the Washington and Lee University Library. He received his PhD and MA from the Department of English at the University of Virginia, where he also held fellowships in the Scholars Lab and acted as project manager of NINES. His primary research focuses on digital humanities pedagogy, which is why we invited him to be here, uh, looking at the ways it can reflect and enact infrastructural change in higher education. He serves on the editorial board of the Journal of Interactive Technology and Pedagogy. He's a regular instructor at HILT, of the, a digital humanities training institute. And he has work, work published or forthcoming with the programming historian, Insights, DLF, Teach Toolkit 1.0, Pedagogy, digital, digital Pedagogy in the Humanities, and Digital Scholarship in the Humanities among others. I personally have had the great joy of learning so much from Brandon over the last decade. And so um, I'm thrilled that he will be uh, giving his workshop and sharing that with everyone at DEF CON. So Brandon, please take it away. Thank you. Thank you so much. Um, so I'm going to try and share my screen and I'm going to try and start my slideshow. Can you see my slides? Can you see the slides as you imagine you would want to see them and not like my notes? Cool. I plan on not having notes anyway, because like it's usually how these things go. Um, thank you so much, Rupsi. Rupsi did a fantastic job of saying a lot of the stuff I was going to say to kill time on this slide uh, to direct you towards uh, this link at the bottom here, which is if you need the slide deck for any kind of accessibility re uh, reasons, or if you just want to have them as you're going through them, uh, you can hopefully follow that bitly link at the bottom and get access to them. Also, we're probably going to have, uh, it's probably more material here than what I'm going to actually get through. So just know that like, as I'm paging through it, the slides should be available there. And if you can't get access to it now, or you want it later and you didn't get a chance to do it now, uh, you can uh, hopefully reach out to me and get access to that. So really excited to work on this with you and to talk about it. Uh, this is a lot of material that I've worked on with small groups of people on campus, but never sort of on a large scale like this with a whole bunch of people in the room. So I'm excited to try it out with you and thanks for being game. Um, so now that I've vamped, uh, I'm Brandon. I'm really excited to be here. Um, I work in the UVA library at the Scholars Lab. Really excited to see some of my UVA library colleagues here. I always try and start out with the slides of like gratitude. So I wanted to thank the DEF CON community, especially Rupsi, Laura, and True. Laura and True were my uh, teaching mentees last year. I learned a lot from them. A uh, lot of other people in the room who I've learned a lot from over the years. Also wanted to thank the Scholars Lab library and community. Um, 
especially the faculty, the students, and the staff. So Eleanor Newman, who makes an appearance here, Rhonda Grizzle, who's our project management specialist, and kind of is running through everything that we're going to talk about today. And then these two people, Adriana and Michael, from the Center for Teaching Excellence at UVA, who really um, have shaped a lot about how I see this stuff as well. Also, for its work, Rupsi, would you mind uh, monitoring like the chat for me and just interrupting me if need be? <laughs> yes. Well, I um, seem to have gotten your link. Oh, it needs to be in all caps. Yeah, it needs to be in all caps. Sorry. But that I think thing? it's a thing sometimes. Okay. Hold on, I'm making it make sure and I'll reshare it. Yeah, I got it. All right. I will. Yeah, you know, what is a DH talk without technical difficulties right out of the gate? Um, yeah, thanks for bearing with me. <laughs> so the way this is going to work is I'm going to give a, we're going to open with a discussion question. And then we're going to have, um, I'm going to give a very short spiel, just like 10 minutes ish talking about like the idea behind the talk, kind of like the idea behind, that frames the abstract for this. And then it's going to be a lot of uh, discussion, a lot of workshop, workshoppy stuff. So, you know, just prepare yourself for that. I'm hopefully not going to go into breakout rooms. I don't think we will need to. Um, but I'm mindful of the fact that this is like pitches and workshops. So I'm going to try and, you know, meet that expectation. Uh, so just to frame things, uh, there's going to be a lot of stuff like this today, a lot of um me giving you a scenario and asking questions about it and then us talking through it so that's sort of why I, I assume we won't cover cover everything uh and i might skip some examples just because i think i probably have more discussion prompts but to begin so you had a graduate student they're teaching a new digital art history course and they want it to culminate in a large collaborative digital project that asks students to draft content for an exhibition in collaboration with a local museum so this person wants advice on how to manage this project. So what are some first questions you might ask them? This is where I found out if you're talkers. Uh, so uh, you can probably, I think, raise your hand and make yourself known. Uh, you don't need to come on video or anything. I hope you're all talkers because this is, a lot, is expecting a lot of talking. Sure. Yes, Alicia. Hi. Um... I think that what I would ask the graduate student is really about the kind of scope because that does seem like a really, really big task. Mm -hmm. And also really asking about the short terms, but also the long terms, um, you know, live livability of this project because some of them tend to be a bit of like a pump and dump situation. And then we end up with a lot of, you know, um, projects that are not sustainable. Um, so yeah, I would ask the scope, the sustainability, uh, the future of it. Um, yeah. Yeah, really great. So like, sort of, what is the thing going to look like? Yeah. Anything else? Any other kinds of questions that might occur to you? Also, thank you for jumping in first. Very brave. Yeah. Um, I would ask, have you talked to the museum? Sure. Very good. Excellent question. May or may not uh, be a plant. <laughs> and, good. Uh, yes. Brandon, hi, Robert. Hello. I was just going to suggest that what other community stakeholders, um, perhaps who were uh, subjects or collaborators with regard to uh, the project, uh, could, you know, were consulted or could be consulted to have a, uh, to have, uh, you know, a, a participatory uh, framework for the creation of the project exhibition. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so both of those comments are really great, thinking about like the resources you have available to you, the people who like probably should already know about this thing that you're working on and what they might bring to it. Yeah, maybe one other thought if anyone has it. Yeah. Um, this is actually Lori and, and Pollock over here. Um, we were thinking about what the starting point is for the students. So whether this is like their first um, like art history class that they're taking or if they're in their first year, what sort of background they might have as a starting point. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I like all those questions a lot. Uh, as expected with these sorts of things, you hit on some of the questions I was hoping you would hit on. You hit on some that I hadn't intended. 
so very good. Um, so this is more or less identical to a scenario that I took part in with a graduate student I'm working with right now, Eleanor, who's an art history student who is part of a fellowship with us was designing a new course. And we were just sort of talking about what she wanted to do, the kinds of plans she had. Uh, and the first thing I actually asked her was why she wanted to do this. She came to me with like all sorts of plans. And I was like, slow down. Like, why do you want a digital, why do you want to do a digital course project? Um, which I feel like is often like we assume that there's a why behind what we want to do, but there's not necessarily and being more intentional about how we frame that I think can help us actually plan what we're going to do. And then, so spoiler alert, the four questions I'm going to put in front of you are going to be the four topics that we're going to cover today. So some of them you already alluded to, what kind of resources do you have at your disposal? Like, does the museum even know that this thing is happening? Uh, who at the museum is going to be your contact? What kind of support do you have there? What kind of communities are involved? Um, what will the thing look like? What's the scope going to be now or into the future, right? Something that is often underexamined when people come to us and talk with us about the thing that they want to do, or they already have a thing in mind and they're committed to it, but they haven't really questioned why it looks like that and what other options there might be. And then the last piece is how are you going to pull it all together? Like you have this thing, this end in sight, what are the steps going to be like along the way? And I think that one of the things Rupsi suggested to me uh, as a topic for this workshop was like how to manage the logistics of doing these kinds of things. Um, so that was sort of the question that started the idea of this workshop, but I was sort of led to the other ones as like equally important in how you approach those. So these are going to be the four topics we're going to talk about. And um, we're going to talk about this all through the lens of project based pedagogy, like this idea that the teaching and learning that we're doing is it's like an engaged student focused approach that's going to have them work on activities or projects that are going to really you know either do real things in the world answer questions in the real world or be based around like the kinds of real problems and activities that we do as digital pedagogy people and as digital humanities people um but what i find uh, and this is sort of behind some of the comments that you were making before is like when somebody comes to me and wants to work on a digital project and i uh, and talking to them about them and I'm asking this question, it sort of becomes clear that like the actual pedagogical reasons for what they're doing are maybe less important than the idea that gotten into their head about the project that they want to do. Like they have this thing in mind, they want to do it, and you start trying to ask questions of it to help them find something that's going to really work for them and really be doable for them. And really what you find is like the teaching is not, is, is like taking a back seat to the idea of the project itself. Uh, and so really it's like this is an exercise in like talking about projects more than it is talking about um, the actual teaching of the thing so that's to say that a lot of times in my own experience working with the praxis program which is a fellowship in the scholars lab where we have students work on projects throughout the year i often find that even when i'm talking to my collaborators about how we're going to do these things uh like sometimes people including myself get so committed to the idea of doing a project without thinking through exactly like all the different things that might mean that it becomes really uh, more difficult to see how the teaching fits into it and like you might be better served by reconsidering the kind of project you're doing whether you should do a project at all um, that sort of thing which is to say we're going to approach all this today through the lens of project management and project design which is where my colleague Rhonda Grizzle has really taught me a lot so this is a slide meant to illustrate feature creep the idea that if something does all things for all people, it really can't do anything at all. And so I like this one because on the left, you see what the user kind of thinks they need or what they've expressed to you what they need. And on the right, you have all the different people who are involved, all the different ideas they have, and the thing just becomes more and more and more complicated. And so in this example, like you can't actually pick the thing up because it would like hurt your hand, right? I really like showing this example to uh, academics because my, my sort of thing that I always tell people is that I think actually the technology is rarely the most complicated piece that people like when people come to talk to us about a project, the technology is rarely the problem. It's usually like, are you open to feedback? Because you have this idea of a project that you want to do. We want to help you realize it, but people get so attached in academia to like their ideas because it's part of the research. They care about it. There are like urgent reasons for doing what they want to do uh, that if you start trying to change them or mess with them in any way, it can feel like a real personal uh, attack or an insult. Um, so it's, it can be difficult to kind of think objectively about the kinds of things you're going to do in your research or in the classroom. 
And so what we're gonna do today is we're gonna try and talk about ways to approach these things through hypothetical examples that will maybe give you some tools to think about how you're gonna do your own work. Um, so that's to say, <laughs> the title that I gave to this talk was against projecting, uh, not against projecting. And as soon as I sent it in, I was like, that's a great title. And it's also the worst title because it asks you to intentionally like mispronounce the word of it in a way it's not gonna parse on the page. So the gist is I'm kind of talking about projecting as a term to refer to like, you have this project that is running the show. You've decided you're gonna do a digital course project and suddenly it's taking over all your time. It's taking over your syllabus. It's not actually doing what you want it to do. Um, so instead of thinking about project-based pedagogy, I thought that this could be an interesting term to just keep in the back of your, your brain. So instead of project-based pedagogy, think about how the projects that you're presenting can really actually be based in projects and pedagogy themselves. So I can really keep pedagogy in the front, keep the teaching in the front, and sort of be like a pedagogy forward approach to thinking about projects, uh, which is to say, be against projecting. Be, don't let the projects tell you what to do. Um, and be, really keep the pedagogy in the front uh, as you're trying to think through these things. So I believe that's the end of, yeah. So that's the end of my short, my short little bit. The rest of this is gonna be very discussion heavy. And I, so I wanna start with like macro plan, middle level plan, and then a micro plan. So from a macro standpoint, I'm assuming there are lots of different kinds of instructors in the room, lots of different kinds of people, with lots of different kinds of affiliations, students, staff, faculty, all different kinds of people with lots of different experiences, expertise, and needs, which is one of the things that was challenging when trying to think about how to approach this because um, like everyone's gonna kind of be in a different place. Some of you might have syllabi that you're actively workshopping. Some of you might never have taught before. Some of you might have taught, but have really no control over what you're allowed to teach. Um, so really, try, I'm gonna try and throw you a lot of different examples at you. Hopefully you'll find something that it sticks and something you can take back to your own work. And then hopefully we can all learn from each other. Because uh, I always find that in teaching, you learn a lot from people who are teaching things very different from you. Uh, also really mindful that this is called workshop. And I often find that people, uh, there's no way to get people more frustrated than if you keep them late. And that if you, then if you tell them it's gonna be one thing, it turns out to be another. Like you go expecting a lecture and suddenly you're being put into breakout rooms or you're expecting a workshop and I just sit here and talk the whole time. So we're gonna transition into a workshop thing in just a second. Only 90 minutes. I don't expect that we'll get through everything, um, but hopefully you'll find a lot of things that can work for you. And then the idea behind these hypotheticals is that hopefully this will be a way for you to just start to treat the teaching examples as like questions and problems that you can approach objectively separate from your own um, relationship to the project that you're talking about. So from a middle, view, this is what the units are going to look like. We're going to talk about learning goals first, the why of what you're doing in the classroom. We're going to talk about resource assessment, what kinds of things are available to you, what kind of resources and support do you have. We're going to talk about the outcomes that your digital projects can lead to. And then the last unit is going to be about how you pull it all together, how you manage the machinery of the thing. So in each of those sections, we're gonna hopefully do this kind of an approach. I'm gonna give you a principle that I would take forward as a way to try and like, if you have one nugget that you wanna take away from each section, what would it be? And then a tool that you can use for trying to think through how to apply that for yourself. And then some hypothetical exercises that we're gonna go through. Uh, I almost certainly have too many exercises or like discussion prompts for each section. So I'm gonna keep an eye on the clock and probably skip some and you can you know hopefully come back to them later. Um, so this begins the discussive part. So this first section of the learning goals, what I would suggest to you is that semester long digital course projects or course activities, course assignments, they shouldn't try and do everything. So if you think back to that feature creep example, really before you decide what your students are gonna do, you need a good sense of your why. Why are you having them do this? what what are the underlying like goals or principles behind what you're trying to do and most importantly like what aren't your goals you don't have to do everything i often feel like trying to figure out what you don't want to do is really useful so the tool that i would submit to you as being really useful for this comes from uh thinks creating significant learning experiences which i first encountered when working with the um, center for teaching and learning at uva 
So the idea in the way that they present it at UVA is when most instructors sit down to design a syllabus, they start in this portion of this wheel, foundational knowledge and application. They start putting down readings, they start putting down topics, right? When in fact, our syllabi and our course experiences contain many different kinds of learning, many different kinds of learning experiences, and the foundational knowledge and the application of that knowledge are really only one piece of that. And so when they run course design institutes, they try and actually have instructors like do the topics, the readings later, so they don't have them do any of that stuff at first, so that they can really think about the other underlying things that they're interested in in the course. So those might be learning how to learn, caring, uh, thinking about the human dimension, and then integration. So connecting ideas, people, different realms of life, all these things together. Um, for what it's worth, I also like this Fink book because it repeats itself a lot. I love a book that's like 500 pages that you can get the gist of in like, you know, five to 10. It's great. And I, I think it really gets summed up pretty well in this um, graph here. So I find that this is a really good first starting point for thinking through like what we're trying to do with course projects, what we're trying to do in digital pedagogy more generally, separate from like what the thing is. So what I want to do is I have a series of discussion prompts and I have this wheel on the right because I don't imagine anyone memorized it that quickly. So what I want you to do is think about this prompt on the left and think about it in relation to the learning, the different types of learning goals on the right. So students are going to collaboratively develop a digital archive in Omeka that maps American protest movements. So given that as a project idea, what different learning goals do we think that addresses or does not address based on the things at the right? Is there anything that jumps out at you? You can raise your hands again or unmute either one. Yeah, I can just go start with the probably some basic things, but I think you get a lot of mapping here. So learning how to use a, the mapping system within Omeka um, and more on I think that connects with foundational knowledge and application in terms of how you construct space and then the foundational knowledge of where the places are, who's involved and sort of the historical background behind it. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Anyone else? We have Monique in the chat mentioning the human dimension. Monique, do you possibly want to unmute and say a little bit more? Um, yeah, so um like basing off of the um the circle map, I don't know if that's what you would call it. <laughs> um the if you use the um human dimension, I feel like that's one of the um learning outcomes that would um, definitely be used if you're looking if you're if students are specifically looking at um, American protest movements because um, they're going to be looking at the different sides of um, the spectrum like in terms of political views like and um, uh, and just personal views as well and so um, when they're even though they're doing um, a, a map they have to take in, in mind like the hum humanity of it as well. Mm -hmm. Allison, I saw that you um, commented in the chat as well. Would you like to to share your thoughts? Well, it, you know, the, the foundational knowledge is one thing, but if they're going to be the human dimension, I agree with um, Michelle that it, it, it or Monique, sorry, excuse me, Monique, um, that it's telling people the history of protest movements, they're going to be collecting would they would care about it so it could be the caring if they have thought themselves about protest movements that they've experienced and just sort of that would be a way into thinking about why they should care about the other history mm -hmm. yeah is there anything that this prompt like this approach does not address in the wheel on the right
and I guess a related question is, um, do you see any risks or dangers in this kind of a, an approach as it's presented here? And I, you know, with the understanding that these are all pretty vague because you know they're all made up, but. Yes. I think sometimes um, the danger can be maybe like making a, assumptions that the connection's going to be made um, with like the students caring about um, like what what it is. And so something that I can see is that they're going to be developing some good skills in creating a digital archive. But if they're not engaging with like the why or for what purpose it's serving mm -hmm. um how they're engaging in it then that's the part that i'd like to see like more fleshed out mm -hmm. yeah so there's like the comment there about like i think a classic risk in like digital pedagogy where like they the students spend so much time building the thing that they don't like they might not actually get to like the thinking that you want them to do underneath it and sherry did you want to say something too I was going to say um, much the same, um, but having to, depending on what kind of class it is and how much they already know about American protest movements, the amount of time that they need to spend in an archive or working online that has nothing to do with creating the digital archive, but just learning about the the movements themselves, I think is what hopefully would be at the forefront. Um, hopefully not to the detriment of of the digital part but a lot of times i feel like we end up with a digital ar archive that maybe is not as complete uh in in terms of the um content because the digital has been forefronted mm -hmm. yeah definitely so what might be a way to um like suggest some revisions to this kind of an assignment or a different approach to it that could maybe address some of those things, maybe specifically by like letting go of some of the pieces of the wheel, right? <laughs> because I think one of the things that I try to do here is like give like a kind of a kitchen sink approach to a digital project, which is like, it's going to do all this great stuff and it's going to kind of hit every piece of my pie and it's going to serve everything that I, every possible thing that it could for my syllabus. And I think you're right that you know there's some real dangers in that. Um, so, like uh, Sherry, if I can pick on you because I know you're a subject liaison, you work with faculty members and this sort of thing all the time. Uh, if you had a faculty member who came to you and was like, "This is the kind of thing that I'm going to work on," and you had that concern, what might be a suggestion that you could offer for you know simplifying it or addressing some of that risk? Well, I don't know uh, about a suggestion, but I would definitely ask. Um try to get at what what their thinking was in making a digital archive like what is what is what is your hope is it to make it a public facing thing so that it has more yeah. you know worth to it um or or make you know make the students feel like they're doing something could it be done in a easier way uh, you know what would be the affordances of not using Omeka of doing, using something else. Th those kinds of questions come to mind. Yeah, totally. And I think disentangling like the platform and that like what it looks like from your goals can help to, you know, come up with different kinds of options. Yeah, any other thoughts about some changes that you might offer or suggestions you might have for simplifying or narrowing the goals of it? Yeah, let's see. Yeah, so I would actually suggest that they swap around, they sort of swap around their thinking to like, to, you know, see what kind of stories and narratives come out of the study of American protest movements, and then to see if there's a thread there that a mm -hmm. class wants to pick up and explore, and then match whatever tool you're going to use to do that. Uh, to to that to to the, that those questions, 
Um, I had this experience. Well, actually, I didn't have this experience, but I had an experience teaching a class on digital Black Atlantic, so Black Diaspora Digital Humanities. The classic problem of it's a digital humanities class, and they don't know anything about digital humanities. They also don't know anything about Black Diaspora. And so one way I got around this in this class was I thought, you know, I'm not going to actually make them do a project. It's just going to be they're going to experiment with tools and methods after we do some some reading and thinking. And maybe they'll do some blue sky kind of dream prototyping, drawn paper kind of things rather than actually doing a project. What actually ended up happening in the class, and it was a graduate class, was that the students said one day about almost halfway through the class, can we actually take one of these ideas and turn them into a project? Because I'd basically given them, you know, a series of materials. I worked with our university archivists to pull together. And so all our sort of thinking and prototyping was through this particular um, set of of um, digitized materials. And so the students really wanted to actually do a project based on it. And they wanted to find different points of entry and different themes for exploring the topic. And so I actually said, well, we could do, you know, we'll have to sacrifice another, you know, couple of methods in order to do this and you won't learn about them, but what do you prefer? And they said, we mm -hmm. want to do this. And I said, all right, that's fine. And we did. And I think it worked only because I didn't start out thinking this is what we're going to do, but instead it sort of came up mm -hmm. organically out of the way the course was designed. Yeah, I like that a lot. I like that kind of like responsiveness to the students and like what their goals and ambitions are um, a lot. Uh, so I'm going to just, as I keep my eye on the time, move on to a different example, just because they're all kind of formatted differently to get at different kinds of questions. Um, uh, let's do, let's do this one. So this is, um, an example that came from Lauren Tilton, uh, and I just always really like it as a, <laughs> a course assignment. So part of the goal behind putting these different examples in front of you is just to show different kinds of ways of doing things. Right. Um, and so this is one that's very different. So as the culmination of your course, students are going to write a project proposal in the style of an NEH application. So. Given that as an idea, with all great credit for Lauren, let's pick apart how she approaches uh, assignments. So um, what kinds of pieces of the wheel does this address or not address? So this is more of like a writing assignment. They're not making an archive. So if that is a question that gives, is like hard to respond to, maybe another way of thinking about it is like, uh what strikes you is different about this approach or why might you assign this as opposed to having them develop an archive yes what do i mean by neh application uh Rupsi or allison because i know you both have written many neh applications would you like to describe what they are <laughs> hell on earth <laughs> Um, so, th but this, uh, yeah, so the National Endowment for the Humanities, um, I, I assume Office of Digital Humanities, because they have a lot of different uh, things. And the, um, there's a very peculiar template, which uh, tells you exactly, and you, you, it behooves you to really follow their exact template and not a sentence more than a certain number of word counts. So it's like writing haiku um, only over and over and over again. Um, difficult if you've got a project that is old and so has a lot of background that you have to try to explain. And mm -hmm. so it really should be eligible, less sorry, legible to anyone, not your specialty cohort. So it's not an article. It's not like your, your own specialty writing. Mm -hmm. 
Yeah, exactly. And so if you're not familiar with an NEH application, you can think about it more as just like the students are going to propose a project and describe in detail sort of like why they're going to do the project, what it's going to look like, what they might need for it. Uh, yeah, Robert. It sort of feels like almost the entire uh, lower hemisphere is missing uh, here. Integration, human dimension, and caring. Um, I'm not seeing. I'm not seeing the connecting ideas or the learning about oneself or others or the the developing feelings, interests, values as much as just a kind of like oh sure. let's let's try that template. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So, um, Rupsi, I'm interested in what you have to say. The question I was going to ask uh is like does that do we how much do we care about that i guess or like why might you assign something like this anyway knowing that it leaves some of those pieces out but rupsi if you wanted to well why don't you go to um jesse and then come back to me sure sorry i didn't want to uh interrupt but i was thinking about where it's sort of thinking about your audience plays into this like in a way it hopefully connects with the human dimension of thinking about um, mm -hmm. others and how your project relates to a larger message. But I think when I think of this project more broadly, the thing that comes to mind is the application and building that skill building for a graduate student seminar. And I think it's, right, as was just said, easy to leave out that human dimension when you're thinking of it in that um, mm -hmm. very sort of specific perspective. Let's see, do you want to share your thoughts? I was going to play devil's advocate and say it actually depends on the on the project. Mm -hmm. um, and I think the challenge, though, is that the description of the assignment is project agnostic. And so behind this is all this um, unseen labor that Lauren does as an instructor to be able mm -hmm. to prepare her students to be at the point where they could actually propose a project. That's my devil's advocate on that one. Yeah, no, I mean, I hope it's clear that I actually like this assignment a lot. Um, I think in part because, and I, I sort of like threw it in here as like a devil's advocate <laughs> kind of thing, because I think one of the things I like about it a lot is that it, um, the kind of thing that it's having the students do is maybe more comfortable for more faculty members, not, not building an archive, setting up an Omeka thing, but like, performing some writing, doing a literature review is maybe something that is more available to people who are maybe newer to digital humanities. Um, but also it recognizes the different kinds of labor that's out there. It's not all about building projects. It's about conceptualizing them and articulating them. Um, but also I think it um, is maybe better scoped to the kind of work. I mean, any H applications are can be large, right? But I think there's a way in which uh, I, I can, it's easier for me to imagine a group of students proposing a project in the course of a semester and not actually doing that project than it is to like out of the gate say you're going to finish a project by the end of the semester. So it just, I feel like it leans a little bit more on, even though it could be speculative, it like, it allows the students the space to be speculative, whereas you might not have the space for them to actually like in reality do the thing, if that makes sense. Um, so I'm gonna, yeah, I'm gonna keep going just in the interest of making sure we get to stuff. So that is like very, very, very quick. And I think one of the things that'll be maybe easier for you as you're working on your own projects and you're is like, you have a sense of yourself, hopefully, or you can find one and you can figure out what your goals are in a way that it can be a little difficult with these hypothetical examples. But I think returning to that wheel and going back to sort of fundamentals for your courses as you're designing them, I think it can help you to figure out how you want to approach the course projects, what they can do for you, what they can't. And just thinking about how you, like your course project does not need to be the thing that connects everything in your course together, covers every single base, every piece of that wheel. And if you can intentionally let some of those pieces go and say like, well, this is really covered by my readings in like weeks one through six, Maybe it's okay if the course project that I designed does not cover that. I think that might just help to um, develop something that's a little more doable for you and your students. The, the provocation I'm putting here is that I think a course project that successfully fulfills a limited set of goals is gonna be better than something that poorly tries to address everything. And I wanted to 
after each one of these units, I, I have like a single resource that I'm trying that I wanted to share in case you haven't seen them before, just to like give you some things to look at further. I'm pretty sure that this resource is like saturated in the DEF CON community, so it might not be news to you, but in case it's, in case it's news, uh, Digital Pedagogy in the Humanities is a really great resource with tons and tons of pedagogical materials. So I really like it because this is just the top of the homepage and this is like scrolled down a little bit. It's organized by keywords. So if you were to say go in the keyword for classroom, you'll find a short um, editorial like piece written by Joyce Walker that talks about what classroom means in the context of digital pedagogy, what some people are doing in that area, some course projects, assignments, activities, syllabi that relate to it. Uh, I also really like it for helping people who are new to digital humanities figure out how they fit in. So a lot of times what I'll do is I'll say, do a kind of like, um, like mapping of yourself, like find the five words that speak to you and circle them and then explore those five things. And you've like found how you might fit into the field, right? Um, so if you're just interested in seeing what other people have done and what other people do, this is a, a place to start, I think. Um, yeah, thanks. <clears throat> For what it's worth, it also comes up if you just Google digital pedagogy in the humanities, but I think somebody else is on it. Uh, I'm going to pause here. Uh, this is the thing I try and do in talks like this, just where I can like force myself to stop in case you have questions or thoughts, provocations, exclamations of, you know, distaste you wanted to share before we, uh, we keep motoring. either about the learning goals wheel or any of the things we talked about so far. Yeah, thank you, Rupsi. So seeing none, I'm gonna continue motoring ahead. There are several other slides like this later on to force me to stop talking, um, but you know, Always feel free to, to interrupt me. Um, cool. So in terms of resource assessment, what kind of support do you have? What kind of resources do you have? That's the second question that we talked about. Um, so people brought it up in relationship to that first example. So that's this second unit. So the provocation that I wanted to put to you is that your digital projects, your digital activities that you're putting into your courses should match the scale of the resources that you and the students have available to give it. So that, I would say, is often a challenge when we are working with faculty or students or staff. They have really good ideas, really big ideas, and sometimes those big ideas don't match the actual reality of what we could do, right? So in this case, uh, resource can mean a lot of different things. Um, it can mean what kind of time and attention and energy do you have for the thing? What kind of funding do you have? What kind of a support broadly construed from your institution do you have? What kind of physical space, like what kind of rooms do you have? And then when I was showing the slide to um, my wife yesterday, she was like, oh, it can also just be like, what kind of skills do you have? Because you put a slide up there about mapping. I don't know anything about mapping. And it's like, oh yeah, that's a really, that's a good point. Um, so because resources can mean many different things, in this case, I think the tools available to you actually are things that you probably use all the time. It's just a matter of like recognizing them for what they are. So things like your calendar, look at the calendar for your course. And if you're trying to insert a digital project into there, like accept that it's gonna take up some space and try and figure out where that space is gonna come from. Uh, what kind of budget do you have for funding? Look at your library staff directory and um, other places at your institution where you might find support. And just speaking for the librarians in the room, the earlier you ask, uh, the more will like you um like everyone equally but especially people who email us early um space reservation systems at your institution and then in terms of like your own skills you know just do some self-reflecting look inward and think about the skills that you do or don't have and um like it's it, because if you're asking your students to do a mapping project because it makes a lot of sense for the course but you don't have any experience with mapping and there's no one at your institution who does you're kind of You'll, you're signing up to learn alongside the students, which might be more than you can, you can handle, right? So, tried to give some other examples here, all of which 
kind of have a gotcha, but I think, um, you know, I think they'll, they'll come out as we discuss them. So again, gonna read, read a prompt, and then I have the little summary of resources at the bottom there. So if you could, I wanna hear what kind of issues you foresee. So you're a graduate student, you're TAing for a large lecture course. You wanna incorporate a digital activity in your course, but you have little control over the syllabus. What kind of issues do you foresee in doing this? I was kind of hoping too that there might be some students in the room who might speak from experience. <laughs> Uh, would you like to say more, Alicia? I think that's an excellent question. Or if you don't want to say more, I can also just read it. Oh, yeah, no, sorry. Oh, yeah, um, Sarah, cool. So, yeah, so I was wondering if it was going to be a sort of like low bridge technology type of activity which can be so very easily um you know um, included in the class which could be like um kahoot or poll everywhere or anything that you know is very sort of simple or would it be like oh i want to design a digital assignment for the class so mm -hmm. is it like an in class or an assignment type of situation those are great questions that's all made up at this point. <laughs> but I think I think you're going to hit it exactly the question, right? Which is like, this, it sounds like this person doesn't have the space to actually do these things. Right. And so this is something that comes up with my with me a lot talking to students in different departments who are teaching different kinds of courses, especially um, people in language courses or language departments like Spanish or French, who might be oh. teaching like introduction to um, Spanish. And they have like a very set syllabus that they're given and they don't have a lot of ability to really move around that very much. Whereas some people who are teaching like um, some of the English department discussions have like a little more flexibility, I think, in what mm -hmm. they have to cover. Um, but yeah, so I think you're exactly right that like uh, the amount of control you actually have over what you're doing in the course might just entirely dictate the nature of the kind of thing that you're going to be able to do with your students, right? Good. Yeah, I, I also think that it depends uh, with it depends with the professor that they're TAing for. Um, because like some of them are more. much more open. <laughs> um I, I was a TA for my advisor, um Valérie Loisho, and she let me teach a couple of classes and um, you know, it was on Zoom because it was during the height of the pandemic. Um, and, you know, she really gave me the freedom to incorporate, you know, whatever I wanted for those specific lectures. Um, but that's also because, you know, she is a more sort of like generous, <laughs> maybe, um, instructor herself. So, but then what I, honestly, what I would suggest to this person is to maybe incorporate some very easy low bridge technology things at first to kind of ease the professor into it and then eventually yeah. work their way out. Excuse me. Yeah, that's great. And I think that's an example of how like an approach that fits this really sort of restricted scenario actually is probably good advice for someone that might be getting started more generally, like those kinds of lightweight ways of getting these sorts of things in the classroom, I think can be totally valid ways to start getting your feet wet. Um, yeah, so I'm going to go to the next one. So this is another common one. You're teaching the same course that you have taught for years, but you've gotten newly interested in digital humanities and you want to fit a get digital course project into your class. What issues do you foresee and why? This might be a scenario that's familiar to some people.
Yeah, sure. I would just say, um, what are you willing to give up uh, in order, you know, if you've already taught this, I'm assuming you have, you know, 12, 14 weeks of uh, content or whatever, and, and how are you going to balance the time that you're going to take to do this? Mm -hmm. So like, what kinds of, um, I guess, so I'm trying to imagine myself as this, as this person, right, who's being told to cut stuff. And I, I guess my question would be like, what, what, what does, what do I need to give space to? Like, if I'm going to cut stuff, why can't this just be something that students do on their own time? Why do I have to give class time to it? Does that make sense as a question? Yes. <laughs> I mean, I, and this is, you, you can just totally speculate too. It's like, like what, if you were giving space in a syllabus to help prepare people for a course project at the end, what kind of stuff would you want them to be doing? Well, now I'm not exactly sure I understand your question, but I would just say if, if you Sorry. used to assign, you know, the final project was a, was a, an essay and most of us assume correctly or incorrectly that students, depending on the level of the course, know how to write an essay. So we're not going to, unless it's a writing course, we're not going to teach them how to write first. But I wouldn't suddenly say, oh, we're now going to create a, yeah. you know, whatever it may be. Uh, and and assume put that on them it's kind of like being and if if anyone's hopefully you all have not done this to your students but you know when uh discussion um uh lms's at got added and you add a discussion and you still have to do all the other assignments but now you have to respond to five people and mm -hmm. put 10 questions in and do all this extra work um so how mm -hmm. much more are you asking of the student um yeah yeah totally and I, I mean i think you even though you said you didn't know what i was asking i think you answered exactly what i was asking which is just like what kinds of you, you can scaffold these things in the same way that you would scaffold other kinds of assignments and uh, important to note that they like take up space on your syllabus and you have to consider that the space that they take up has to, in most cases, take space away from something else. So another one, you're instructor of record for a course and you want the students to create digital maps. What kind of resources will you need for this? What kind of support would you need? So if you're a mapping person, you might have specific answers to that. Uh, if you're not a mapping person, you probably have questions, which are exactly the kind of questions that might be worth sharing. I am a mapping instructor. I mean, I've used mapping in uh, my classes and you want to make sure that the software that you're using is the most um is you know free <laughs> because some of those mapping software you know especially developed by um esri or esri are very expensive very costly and obviously if you are uh, a private institution they have you know um computers with um, licenses on them and things like that but you have to think about making it the most accessible possible and then um so that could be for example story maps you know which is a good alternative um and then you might need someone who could give them a workshop um if that's not available you need to identify the resources yourself so you might want to find tutorials specific that can help them or if you can give it yourself it really depends i think yeah, exactly. You hit on basically everything that I was thinking. Jesse, did you also have something or did you just um, happen to serendipitously turn your video on? Uh, you're muted, but I can see you talking. Thank you. I was going to say something else in the long but I was also just thinking in terms of, you know, depending on what this is like. Um, and I think that it's easy to forget about it. it's the how difficult it is to find the coordinates. And so just taking the time before assigning a project to 
testing the advocacy if this is something that is easily findable or is part of the project itself and figuring out how you do that type of research. Yeah, totally. And I think this is a space in which the um, other people at your institution, either on what the in your library, other people on your campus or people in the DEF CON community can help to try and figure out like what kinds of resources you would need to be able to do something like this. Uh, the Esri like institutional license versus free software was especially something that I had in mind with this slide um, and whether or not you know how to do these things yourself. Uh, so that's just to say that like certain kinds of technologies require different kinds of resources. And the more you do this, the better sense you'll have of like lightweight approaches to do similar kinds of things. So you might be able to incorporate certain kinds of approaches to digital mapping that might get at some of the things you want without necessarily having to have an institution that pays for an ESRI license or ArcGIS or something. Um, yeah, so I'm gonna do one more. Should I do one more? Um, actually, I'm not. Uh, I'm just gonna keep rolling through because you can look at those scenarios later on. But the gist of these, um, scenarios from this unit really is like when you're thinking about the project that you want to do try and figure out whether you're trying to fit a square peg in a round hole try and figure out whether you're really starting from the real world what kinds of like what does your real world look like at your institution and for you and your department what kinds of things do you have available for you what don't you have what might you be able to push and stretch but what are sort of like hard limits that you won't be able to sort of push back on i think um speaking from my position in the library a lot of the conversations we have with people is just helping them to see sort of the, the world as it is for them uh like, like your idea sounds great we would love to be able to do what you want to do but we can't really do that we can do something similar to get to your goals um and i think the if you can start to develop the ability to do that for your own work i think it's kind of a superpower to some degree um so the other resource so another like really useful thing that you could check out on your own later is this text on the right. I think it has a different cover now because I think this is the cover from the first edition. Uh, Using Digital Humanities in the Classroom by Claire Battershow and Shauna Ross. Uh, I really like this text. It's very practical and approaches basically any kind of issue you could imagine in terms of doing digital humanities in the classroom and teaching digital humanities. Um, and they're especially really good, I think, on like you want to try and teach DH in the classroom, here's how to assess the resources available to you in your um, your climate. Like, do you have access to WordPress licenses, who to talk to about um, web space and those sorts of things. So I, I highly recommend checking this one out. It's also another one that I think you can, you don't have to read straight there. You can dip in and out of and find useful uh, information. So this is another pre-programmed time to pause. Does anyone have thoughts or questions before we move to the next section? Cool. Seeing none, I'll keep moving. Um, we have two more sections. We're kind of tracking for time as anticipated. Um, so next section designing outcomes this refers to that question like what is your thing going to look like because a lot of the work that we do in terms of consulting with people on projects is helping like taking what someone brings to us as a starting point and helping them to change it slightly to get to something that's really workable so the provocation here is the best course project as like an outcome the best things your student can do is something that fulfills your goals in the smallest tightest easiest way possible that's to say that your ambitions uh, can be small and still fulfill your goals, which is to say, uh, I think that there is an underlying anxiety that's maybe worth addressing. And this is something that I brought up with my student, Eleanor, when we were talking about her course project, was she had all these great ideas, all this stuff, and it was really a lot. And I was just sort of like stopped. And I said, after I asked her why, I was like, don't feel pressured to make this course like DHE enough it is a digital humanities course. It's great. You don't have to have like, your project design that you're coming up with doesn't have to prove something to yourself, uh, which is to say, 
a lot of the talks that I wind up giving wind up coming back to imposter syndrome, which is something that I live with every day of my life. Um, and uh, I think that there's a way in which like wanting to be taken seriously as a DH scholar, wanting your course projects to really reflect the kind of DH work that's of value to you. I think there's a way in which like anxieties about feeling like enough of a digital humanist can sort of infect and um, push your course projects into a position where they're really like the idea of the project is running the show more than what you actually want it to do, if that makes sense. So part of what I'm hoping is that this sort of workshop you're sitting through will give you some tools with which to reassess your relationships to those projects and think through uh, how you can change them so that they still do what you want them to do, even if the shape of them changes. And the tool for doing this is a matrix that uh, Rhonda Grizzle has used a lot in our project design workshops with our students. It's an action priority matrix. It's pretty straightforward. Uh, so on the y-axis on the left, you have impact or value. And on the x-axis on the bottom, you have effort. So essentially, like how important is something and then how hard is it? And the idea that Rhonda does with this exercise, which is really great, is she gives people um, where you're, they just run them through a discussion and she asks them to plot different things based around the conversation that they're talking about. Like, how important is this? How hard is it? And then you can sort of start to very quickly put different pieces of a larger problem into different parts in your graph and see, like, in a very visual way, what things you maybe need to care a lot about and which things you don't like care about at all. So, like, changing, um, like, infrastructure reform in higher education, which was a phrase from my bio that uh, Rupsi brought out at the beginning, a major project, very important, very hard, right? Um, answering email could be anywhere from, you know, very easy to very hard, very high value, very low value, depending. Um, but in terms of course projects, I think this kind of a graph can be really useful for thinking through like the different elements of a project and which things are really challenging, which things aren't, and which things are actually important to you. So what I'm hoping, is that we can think through some of these course projects and uh, try and figure out which pieces of them feel really challenging and which pieces of them feel really, really important because part of like changing your relationship to these projects and redesigning them, I think re relies on you breaking them into smaller components, right? Into features. So it's sort of like a fundamental um, tool of project design. So what I wanna do, I'm going to read a scenario and then I want us to talk about the different components of it and where it might fit on this axis of how hard this partic a particular thing is or how and how um, important it is. So we have a semester long collaborative multimedia essay on an issue of local importance. It includes interviews with community members and we're going to launch it at the end of the course. So if you would, there's a lot there. Maybe what I'd suggest is pick one piece, like one element of that course project. And then if some, if you would uh, volunteer to just talk through where you would put it in terms of how challenging it is and how important it feels to the spirit of what they're trying to go for. So someone before with the museum example, I want to say it was maybe Robert was talking about like the community members and um, like, have you talked with the community members who are of importance to this? That, that kind of is, I think, behind this prompt too. So would you maybe want to say a little bit about like where you might plot that in terms of how important it feels, how challenging it is? Sure. Thank you. Yeah. It it, um, it feels kind of close to home. I'm in the middle of a project like that right now that started thanks to a um, a course uh, development project last year with DEF CON. Um, the one thing that caught my eye about this example, this exercise is that launched at the end of the course can be a lot of pressure. <laughs> mm -hmm. And um, 
And so I found myself speaking with the, the, the students who were driving a lot of the interviews um, to uh, build in a lot of disclaimers. And, and that feels a little, wow, going back to your point about imposter syndrome, a little like, oh, uh, we're, 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 we're already apologizing that this might not end up getting launched by the end of the term. <laughs> But mm -hmm. we're doing our best, and it's a student project, and um, and and so in some ways, this uh, you know this this all to me is is on the major projects uh, side of um, the mm -hmm. uh, the graph, um, and I'm I'm kind of curious, Brandon, if you've like, any any please. Uh, Give me a little more um, nudge if you'd like on what uh, what you think this what do you think uh, I could draw out of of my examples with using community partners? It's yeah, totally. I mean, I my I think I think you're absolutely right that it feels like it's a major project for you, very important for what you're doing and um really challenging right mm -hmm. um and i think you you fit you fixing on like the launch at the end of the course i think is really smart because i sort of put that in it's like i'm trying to like plant particular seeds that are they feel very obvious to me because i wrote the question right but i mean you could delete that last sentence right yeah and the spirit of it feels <laughs> pretty similar and I think there's a way in which you might have really good, important learning goals for wanting to launch something, but just because you haven't launched it, like it doesn't mean that it hasn't fulfilled a lot of your course goals, right? Yeah. Um, and so I think there's also a way in which like um, those caveats, you know, they might feel like you're apologizing to your students for yeah. not taking the thing public, but really they can also just sort of be pedagogical outs or like pressure release valves, like. Um, you don't, you can free yourself of the, the pressure to feel like you have to produce something public because also the students might feel, produce something that like, you know, I'm all about student work, all about student experts, but at the end of the day, sometimes they might not produce something that's like either worth sharing or they might, you know, you could have students, especially if you're working with, uh, sensitive topics and community members that might like actually like damage the relationship between you and your community members. And so you. Mm -hmm it might be important that you not launch something at the end of the course, right? Mm -hmm. um, all of which is kind of a roundabout way of saying that I think I put that line in there specifically because it feels like an easy thing that you could pull out and say, well, we could easily take this out and the spirit of what we're doing wouldn't change too much. Right, You're good. And then by the way, I, um, uh, I, I found that using design world uh, which, which in a way this is, it's, it's project design, multimedia, um, interface and, uh, experience user experience design. The, 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 uh, the alternative language I've been trying to use is we're going to, at the end of our course, which we're on these quarters too, which are even shorter, 10 weeks than most semesters, we're going to pitch to the community, our first draft or prototype Probably. of our idea. Um, and then I'm lucky that I've got the kind of um, flexibility with a course that's a, a, an elective, something that can be my own personal project every quarter or so that, that mm -hmm. I can say. And if, and, and if that goes well, we might have a future um, quarter devoted to actually launching the project. Mm -hmm. Yeah, absolutely. And Sherry had a really good point in the comment in the chat um, that it depends on how much effort you're asking. When you make community members, you want the don't want the interviewees to feel like their contributions are thankless. So, yeah, we talk a lot with people at UVA about like um, members of the Charlottesville community. What is their relationship like with the university? What kinds of credit or compensation are meaningful to them? What can we ask of them? What shouldn't we ask of them? Um, Robert, your point about Prototyping is a really good one because I think, yeah. So I wanted to just put this out there because it connects to a couple things later on, but this is something that's really near and dear to my heart. So a prompt that says students will write a paper proposing, oh wait, no, maybe that's not actually. 
we'll come back to that. <laughs> um, so I, I actually don't have a prompt for this, but one of the main outcomes that I usually try and do when I teach is try and think through what kinds of sort of off the wall speculative prototyping or storyboard can you do even including like drawing that'll get at the ideas that you want the students to really illustrate without necessarily having them practice the technologies and maybe they'll practice the technologies in a different capacity. Um, but that was really something that I was drawn to as a graduate student teaching these materials for the first time. I think my first teaching uh, request as a graduate student to teach digital humanities was I was asked to teach programming for three hours to people who I didn't know what their background was and I didn't know who the students were and I also didn't feel like I knew programming <laughs> in any sense so what I hit upon was sort of the something that you were alluding to Robert which is just the idea of really thinking it thinking it as thinking it through as an exercise and like how can I teach these concepts without the technology itself and so what I started doing was designing pencil and paper exercises for working with text analysis questions that you can really do without any technology in the room. It was a lot easier for me to do as a teacher, um, a lot easier I think, for the students to learn. And then if the students were really interested, they could follow up on, with Python and learn more. But it was a way to sort of design an outcome that I felt like was doable for me that I can use in many different circumstances um, that in a certain way embraced my feeling of imposter syndrome because I was like, I don't feel qualified to do the programming piece. So I'm just not even gonna try. Instead, I'm gonna develop this other thing that kind of meets my students where they are. Um, so I'm gonna keep rolling, just continuing to watch the time. Uh, this is just, if you just Google dogs and cats pretending to be each other, you'll find lots of things like this. I've given entire talks with slide decks that are nothing but images like this, but the gist of this is just that, um, the institution will at a, institutions and higher education in general will tell you at every step of the way that you don't belong. And I think digital humanities is no different, like whether or not you need to program or be a certain kind of person or have certain kind of skills, like those kinds of things will always be out there. So I want to give you permission <clears throat> as much as I can to teach the way that you want to teach the things that you want and to not feel pressured as much as I can to um, include things on your syllabus, like course projects that don't feel authentic to the kind of teaching you wanna do. Um, so that's just to say that if you find yourself wondering if a course is DHE enough or if a project is DHE enough, maybe take that as an opportunity to step back, remember these dog photos and, um, you know, just to really try and question whether or not that's a useful question for what you're doing or whether or not the outcome actually is going to be fine, even if you don't take it that extra step further and do something really complicated computationally. Um, yeah, I'm not sure if that makes sense, but that's just to say, free yourself from the pressure to be DHE enough, design an outcome that's doable for you and your students, um, but especially for you. Um, and I think ultimately that's one that you'll be happier with and that your students will be happier with. So here's some other readings. These, uh, I feel cheapish putting my own thing on there, but hopefully it's useful. But these are things that specifically get at the idea of like prototype, prototyping and minimal approaches to uh, course design and project design. Uh, and Danica's talk, um, I think it started as a talk with DEF CON and then eventually became an article uh, with JITP. Really great, so a nice little stitch with the DEF CON community. Um, but hopefully there will be some things there if you're looking for other kinds of examples and ways of thinking about doing kinds of pencil and paper, paper approaches to course projects and course outcomes. I'm a big fan of them. Uh, I'm gonna not pause for thoughts because this next section is very short and then I'm gonna pause and sort of hopefully give a little space at the end in case people have anything they wanted to talk about. So this next last section, managing the machine does not have any hypothetical scenarios because Really so far, we've been focused exclusively on like the why and the what, um, and not really done a whole lot of like actually how you manage the logistics of what you're doing with the students. I think because the why and the what really drive so much of everything else that if you sort of, you can solve a lot of problems there for yourself. Um, and in a workshop context, how you manage the logistics of your course, I think feel it's gonna feel very specific to you and very personable. So I thought instead I would just like, give you some ideas and some resources that you can check out on your own. So this will probably go a lot quicker. Um, 
And I'm, I'll go quickly because you'll have access to the recording and hopefully the link to this so you can come back and explore them more later. Uh, but these are the kinds of things that we work on, with a lot in the Scholar's Lab. So it's presented as a like, problem and then a way to try and meet that problem. So one problem is that working with students, especially students in collaborative course projects, it requires an awful lot of emotional labor. It's a lot of just managing people, managing groups of people, and trying to get them to work together. So a tool that we use in the Scholar's Lab are things called charters. You can find a lot of them online. Um, you can find them on the Scholar's Lab website and on the Praxis Program website here. I can share some links to them, but they're essentially uh, a group document that outlines shared values, shared principles, working practices, how you're going to be together, the kinds of things you care about, the kinds of things you don't care about, what you're going to do together. So it's kind of like a manifesto for group work. It does not solve the problems of collaborative work, but it does hopefully get people talking honestly and intentionally about the ways that they're going to relate to each other up front. So that in a way that you can then refer back at a later date if um, someone's not fulfilling their um, the way that they're saying they're going to work with you. Uh, so we have almost all of our all of our students who work on collaborative projects with us put these kinds of things together. It's a really interesting activity. They always come out looking slightly different, but I think they're really useful in the course context. Another problem. How do you keep track of student progress on a collaborative project? Uh, one tool you might use for that is something called Trello. So this is a Kanban board approach, which is to say many different kinds of columns. Uh, it's it's a thing that really it, it's meant to mimic like putting post-it notes on a whiteboard. So a Kanban approach to project management, I think, is like your task list, what you're currently working on, and then what's done. And you move things across the different columns as you're working through them. So Trello, if you just never heard of it, is a really great project management tool. It has like more bells and whistles and features than you could ever possibly want to even like conceive of existing in the world. Uh, but even the free version, I think, is really useful. So this is the Journal for Interactive Technology and Pedagogy's web committee, like our Kanban board that we were using at one point. Um, it might be a little more robust than what you need for a lot of your course projects. But if you're doing something with like, tw say, 20 to 25 students, and they're going to be working for a semester. It can be really useful both just like to track what they're doing, but it can also be a useful tool like as a thing for them to go out knowing what it is and how to how to interact with it. It's another problem. How do you scaffold a digital project? Is it different from a typical assignment? I wanted to just offer this little approach that we use in the Scholars Lab, which is um, it's a comes from a spirit of project management called Agile project management, which is really just to give you this graph. What we do with all of our students working on projects is try and think in two week intervals. So you design, divide up the amount of time that you have into two week chunks. You think about what you can do in each of those two week chunks, and then you have a check in at each of those two week intervals to talk about what you've done, what you haven't done, what's coming next, that sort of thing. So I think just like in terms of outlining the kind of work that you would do with students over the course of a semester, knowing, like trying to break it into chunks like that in the same way that you would break a syllabus into like different units and topics, just thinking like very logistically about like in this two weeks, I want them to do X in this two weeks, I want them to do Y, et cetera, et cetera, I think can help you start to um, get a sense of how you might manage the thing. And if you feel like you don't have enough space in the two weeks chunks that you've allotted to get the whole thing done and it's a sign that your plan is too big and you should probably scope it down. And then I think this is the last piece is just to gloss the term scrum, which is something that comes here on the slide. So this is just a tool that I that comes from agile development as well that can address a problem that we often have when we're working with collaborative partners or with students where like, you're like, okay, this is our two week check in. We want to find out what's been going on with the project. Uh, and then suddenly that discussion takes like two and a half hours and you don't actually teach anything. You don't get to your course material. Like, what do you do? So, Scrum refers to uh, rugby. So, it's like this like huddle where the, I think you get together and you try and move the ball forward. I'm not a sports person. So, anytime I try and talk about sports, I feel like way more of an imposter <laughs> to go back to that other slide. Um, but the idea behind a Scrum is that it's meant to be very quick and meant to address particular things and not to you're not supposed to discuss anything with it. So an example of a scrum would be, we're gonna all get together, we're gonna give our updates 
and we're each going to answer these three questions. What did I do yesterday? What will I do tomorrow? What's in my way? And you sort of go down the line and you maybe make a note of things that need more discussion later on. So when I do this in the context of working with students, we'll even do it like it'll be like 10, 15 minutes at the beginning of like a two hour session. We'll just have people go down the line and they get very used to it's hard at first, but the more you do it, they get very used to talking really quickly and not elaborating and just like getting the issues and what they're working on out there such that you can then sort of get like a to do list of things you need to work on and address. So it can feel very weird in an academic context and very weird in a um, teaching context, but I think it's also a way of like starting to make the classroom feel more like um, like a, a team working on a thing if you have a large project that's going to have a lot of moving pieces that you need to coordinate. So I, I just threw a ton of stuff at you, uh, especially in the last 10 minutes, in part because I wanted to not go right up to 630, but give a second in case people had any other things they wanted to talk about or things we wanted to talk about more. Uh, hopefully you can come back to those slides and uh, find things to look at further. If there's anything you want to email me about, I'm also happy to chat. But this is your last pre-programmed slide uh, to see if you have anything that you wanted to talk about, anything I left out or anything you have questions about, things you want to talk about further. Just Brandon, Thanks. while it's still fresh on Scrum, did uh, by um, run by the same person, does that just mean one facilitator of, and 15 minutes total? <laughs> yeah. Yeah, yeah, so when so our the scrum person in our group is usually Rhonda because she's a trained project manager and she usually tells people they have no more than one minute to talk. And so like you go in your one minute, you say what you did, what you didn't do, what's going to be coming up. And then they run it around and Rhonda is running it. And it's just really meant to be extremely quick. Um, you know, you can even have a fun little like Oscar music that's going to play you off the stage kind of thing, which people wow. have different relationships to. But yeah, I mean, it's sort of a comical amount of compactness, especially for academics, but it's like a maybe a goal to strive for more than anything else. Does that answer your question? I mean, I try it. Yes, thanks. Cool. Yeah, anything else? Questions, comments, life? things, triumphs? Um, I've got a, a question. So I've used like the Scrum and Agile and Trello before for a project-based course. And it was it was a really short one. It was like a one month intensive, but I found it hard to get the students to in, like engage with that project management style just because I think they hadn't used it before. And it's sort of like, I ended up kind of abandoning it at one point just because um, I felt like I couldn't kind of like make them use it if it like if they didn't sort of like see the purpose or see the need like for the team. And so I was curious about how um, mm -hmm. how you get them to sort of buy in or see like the value in the pro in the process. And I did sort of you know like talk through like how and why it was used and sort of how it was used in other other teams, but I found it hard to convince that set of students to, to engage with it. Yeah, that's a really excellent question that I feel like is like a fundamental question about co-working in general, not just the students. It's like you have a new kind of workflow you want someone to adopt. How do you get people to actually buy into it? Um, what we've done with our students is show them some options. So usually it's as a part of the year for Praxis where we're giving them like a workshop on project management in general. And then we, so they get the whole like hour discussion of project management, which is probably more than you're gonna wanna put into a, a general course. But what you might take from that is that at, at the end of that, we then say, okay, here are like two or three options for different kinds of approaches. We usually show them Trello, uh, Basecamp and GitHub, like different ways that you might manage the conversation. And we basically say, you have to use one, decide as a group which one you want to use. And some years they gravitate towards GitHub, some years towards Basecamp, some years towards Trello. Um, you know, if, if your students are really into putting post-it notes on the board, that seems, and you have a board that you can put post-it notes on, that seems great to me. Um, so really just like, 
offering them the space to try and feel like they've chosen it as a group might be a, a first way in that I would try. But I, I mean, I totally sympathize and I, I've also been there, so. Yeah, and there's a great comment in the chat about asking them to choose an approach and then including it in the, in the team charter. I think some years when we've had students who were trying to project manage the group and weren't getting that kind of buy-in was to make space for it in the class or in the session together. So to say like the first 10 minutes, we're gonna go through and we're gonna like update Trello and look at Trello together. And then after a while, you don't need to keep doing that, but you're sort of like, you know, forcibly modeling it for them for a little bit. Any last thoughts or questions in our waning time together? Well, Brandon, thank you so much. Um, I am getting like secret back channel messages saying how awesome oh, this good. is. good. <laughs> And uh, we're so grateful for you for really showing us how to think um, about planning courses that incorporate projects. And I think that was really, really incredible um, to have to think through that with you and with everybody um, here. So thank you so much. Thank you to everybody for joining us. Uh, we hope we'll see you next month at um, Kathy Barron's talk on March 13th. More info at digitalethnicfutures.com. We hope you have a good evening. Thanks, Thank Brian. you all so much for coming. I always loved hearing you. Brian, for me.